In 2017, right, you, you released a paper, small molecule modulation of splicing factor expression is associated with the rescue from cellular senescence. Uh, could you talk about the main things that you found in that? Because uh, like yeah. recovering from senescence is not something that is generally thought is possible. No, no, no. So, so to, you know, to, to be honest, we it was an accidental discovery. So, so what we were trying to do I was looking for things that moderate levels of splicing factors. I was, so I'm an RNA biologist by trade. That's what, that's what I've been brought up to do. And I was interested in things that could be used to just on, just in an academic sense, looking at how they were regulated and what could influence them. And there was a paper from a few years before that study that had suggested that polyphenols could regulate a couple. So this is where my collaboration with Richard came in, in that we, I knew Richard through the British Society for Research on Aging and over coffee one day, I, you know, I, I knew that they, him and Lizzie Osler were working with these resveratrol molecules that they've got. And we just said, I just said, oh, can I have a look and see what they do? You know, if, to see whether or not they, they switch our, our genes up. And, 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 that, and, and they were quite happy to collaborate on that. And, um, and yes, they do switch the splicing factor genes up very nicely. So we treated our, these were senescent dermal fibroblasts, human, um, three different, three different um, cell backgrounds or, or genetic backgrounds. Um, we put our, our chemicals on and we measured the splicing factors to see what happened. And they come up, all of them actually come up quite nicely. They get restored to pretty much where they are in young cells. Um, but it had that interesting spin-off that we started to notice that the cells had the, the senescent cell load of the cultures had dropped by about two thirds. The cells had re-entered the cell cycle and we had attenuated some aspects of the SAS. So when you're saying about reversal of senescence and whether or not that's possible, I think the simple answer to that is, is I, I think it is, but maybe not for all types of senescent cells. So I think one of the things that people think about is that senescent cells are one thing they're not there's so many different subtypes um, and so many different routes to senescence so I think what we've been able to get a handle on I don't think it is the terminally senescent chromatin lockdown damaged you know fit for no one cells that we are addressing I think they will remain I think we are dealing with paracrine senescence I think that what we're doing is we are we're reversing those cells which have entered senescence because of the bystander effect. I think we are addressing those. And I think we're also addressing cells which are senescent, but maybe not so tightly locked down senescent, but there is still a way out for them. So, you know, I'm not claiming that this is the magic bullet that is going to reverse every senescent cell in the body. It absolutely is not. But I do think that what we can do is to get a handle on, re on reducing senescent cell burden by ba basically resetting the clock in some of those subsets of senescent cells. That is possible. We demonstrated it now, as I say, with, with resveratrol, but we, we went on, um, the next thing we did after that study was to say, okay, we've done that with polyphenols. Are there other chemicals out there that can do it? Um, so we looked for, I, I was looking for other sort of candidates and I stumbled across this, these uh, hydrogen sulfide donors and hydrogen sulfide is another one of those, um, it's an endogenous cellular signaling molecule that had been tied in with health span benefits. So we just thought we'd have a look and, and yes, it does. This time you don't see global rescue of splicing factors. You see a very specific response with just a couple of them, but we do see cellular, um, we, we do see reversal of um, senescence according to, to senescence associated beta galactosidase activity. We see that. This time we've uncoupled from proliferation though. So it's possible to reverse some bits of senescence, but not others. So in a therapeutic context, you might not actually want to cause those cells to re-enter cell cycle. So what you actually want to do is you don't, you don't, it's not the presence of the senescent cells per se that is the problem. It is what they're doing. So what we want to do is to stop them secreting the SAS. We don't necessarily want them to grow. So by tweaking how we are which splicing factors we're influencing on how we're doing that, we can uncouple some of those phenotypes that we might not want to reverse. And we have subsequently gone on to identify the genes that are responsible for the, um, the dysregulation of splicing factors and, and demonstrate that when you target those directly with targeted genetics, you can cause the same effect without the pleiotropic effects. It would be nice to just quieten the senescent cells down so that yeah. they're not so secreting SAS, but you would want to do that kind of one time and finish, right? Rather than to have to continuously. 
Yeah, well, the, I don't think you have to continuously. So in our, our data, it suggests that these are long lasting effects. So once the cells are kind of turned back, they're turned back and they will start to senesce again. But it's not it's not something that you'd have to be taking a pill twice a day to be able to do. Uh, in our hands, we've seen out to about six or eight weeks in tissue culture. Um, you see that they are still you can still see a drop after. So you treat them at you treat them at baseline and then you you follow them just to see what they're doing without any other additional um, impact. But and, and you see that they're still they're still um, younger than they were. If we treat weekly, you get an additive effect. Um, and that's with small molecules. With the targeted genetics, you've kind of got a, a two pronged approach because you've got the reversal. So you've got the same thing that, that you, you know, they don't immediately reverse. But also because when you put in, we are targeting the genes with oligonucleotides because we know the specific points at which to prod to get it to do what we want. And when you put an oligonucleotide into a cell, actually a proportion of those oligonucleotides get taken up into um, vesicles and you get a slow release effect in the cell. So we're not anticipating that, you know, in the future when these things are, and, and I do think it's a when, when these things are out there for attenuating senescence phenotypes in the clinic, this isn't going to be something that will need to be a daily tablet. It will probably be something that you need to take every couple of months, I'd say. Oh, 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 oh,